Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Miller. Every week, I chat with fascinating people from all walks of life in order to bring you knowledge, inspiration, and insight. If you enjoy the show, you can support it by subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing it with a friend. This is the Jeremy Miller Podcast. All right, Pete Rubish, so excited to have you on the podcast today, dude. How are you doing? Doing well. Just uh, finished up a five-mile run not long ago, so... Nothing too crazy. It was like 8.30 pace, but for me, that's really fast, so I'm happy with it. Got a lift in. It's been a good day. Trained some clients. All the things. That's awesome, man. Well, 8.30 pace for it. I'm assuming those are just easy miles. Like That's pretty dang good. That's about where I'm at. Well, you're way faster than me, and it was supposed to be a little easier than that, but sometimes I get a little ahead of myself and push <laughs> Um, it was supposed to be an easy run. I, I definitely pushed it a little more aggressively than I should have. But no, I'm just trying to get on your level because I've seen like your PR times and all that. And that's ridiculous. I mean, you did, wasn't it close to like a, a 120 half? And then you did, uh, you know, 250 marathon and just ridiculous times. I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, the level I'd like to get to someday. It's going to take a lot of work, but I, I look up to guys like you just with crazy fast times like that and you still have the muscle. So that's really cool for me to see. Well, I appreciate the kind words. Um, but I mean, you, I've been doing it for longer than you, I think, cause you're, you're like just getting into running, right? Oh yeah. See, I'm super new to it. I've been doing it like five months. Um, I, I know like it takes time to build up to that pace and, and get to a point where you're faster like that. So I respect the time, investment that you have to put into it it's just like with lifting lifting you're not going to go from you know a 400 pound deadlift to a 600 pound deadlift in a matter of months it just takes time so i know that it's the same principle with running i don't expect to get to those numbers or those times overnight or you know even if they're ever there at all but um i, I still like you're a perfect example of someone who lifts and they have quite a bit of muscle still and you're still out there killing it which is cool to see for me because I want, you know, to see examples of guys with a lot of muscle mass who are still running fast times. I don't want to just go out there and have like a, a normal run where it's where I'm middle of the pack or whatever. I want to be fast. So I look up to, to people like you because your times are ridiculous. Well, dude, I will say like where you're at five months into your journey versus where I was at five months into my journey, you are so far ahead of where I was, where I was at. Like I remember my first really one to two years of getting into running. I don't think I ever did a double digit run. Uh, I would basically just go out and try and run like a one mile PR every single day. Cause I had no clue how to train properly. Didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I was always hurt, like shin splints, plantar fasciitis, runner's knee, like everything you can think of. So I was just a wreck for the first couple of years. Um, and then it was finally, you know, taking time to learn about the journey and, and how to train properly. That's where the progress started to come. But for the first couple of years, I didn't make any progress at all. So I think you're way ahead of where I was at for sure. Yeah. I mean, a big part of that has been having a coach and it's just a local guy. Um, he kind of helped me out, formulate a plan. So there's different days where there'll be three easier run days and then there'll be like a long run, obviously. And then I'll have a, a lactate threshold type day and then another um, speed type day, either fart licks or on the track. I'll do kind of uh, 800 repeats, something along those lines. So mixing it up to where it's just every day there's kind of something different. That's been huge for my speed development. Because before that, I was just kind of going out and running, you know, whatever pace I could, just as fast as possible for the same distance repetitively. But it only did so much to build my speed up. And I think that's where most of the progress has come from, is just mixing things up, different heart rate zones and, and things like that. That's been kind of crucial over the course of the last month, I've made more progress than I did over the first like three, four months, which is wild. That's huge, man. Um, yeah, I think, okay, before we dive too deep into this, I feel like we need to tell people more about your background and, uh, and, and then we'll go into running later because you're, you have such a unique story and it's, I think it's gonna be super inspiring for a lot of people and just a ton of valuable knowledge I think you can provide. Um, so do you kind of want to just, take us back to like the powerlifting days what got you into powerlifting and, and we'll kind of start from there yeah so I kind of got into powerlifting at age 14 and I was dabbling with weights before that I want to say like age 12 I was doing some bench some curls core work 
uh, things of that nature. And then I started taking it more seriously when my dad, he got this weight set. Um, like I said, I was 14 at the time. We had a weight set in the basement, nothing fancy. And he started getting into lifting and then I started getting into it because I would see him do it. And I realized pretty early on, I was like, okay, I'm really good at deadlift. That was the lift where I just, it naturally, it came naturally to me. It felt really good. I was really strong at it and bench, not so much. Bench was pretty bad with the longer arms, but I started to love it. I started to love seeing the changes in my body, putting on, you know, mass and just kind of bulking up because I was always really skinny. Um, you know, my dad, he's, he was like 6'6", 185 at the time. He's, you know, a pretty skinny guy. And Dang. I was like 130, you know, 40 pounds, no muscle mass. So I wasn't popular at all in school. Didn't have a ton of friends. Uh, people were kind of going their own way at that point where everybody was getting into partying and, and alcohol and that sort of thing. And I was raised in a, in a pretty strict household where my parents were definitely opposed to that. And uh, they wanted me to get like the best grades possible, go to college, that sort of thing. So they kept me pretty in line, which I'm thankful for. Like it worked out great. But lifting was kind of my domain where I would come home from school. I would go to the basement, lift heavy for like three hours. No structure to it, just pushing as heavy as possible day in and day out. And I started to kind of get respect from people. I never would say I was popular in high school or anything like that. But I just realized like nobody would pick on me, first of all. Um and there was just like this disrespect that I, I got from lifting and, and got from from developing myself in that manner. So that was really addictive. And I just kind of took it from there. Um, I got to, to college, University of Wisconsin, and I met some people there who were into powerlifting. They kind of got me into the sport where I started competing at a young age. You know, 17 years old was my first powerlifting meet um, and started getting way more serious about it. Like I started having a training plan, really taking it seriously, uh, hitting some crazy numbers, like a 700 pound deadlift. I think I was 18 Jeez. or 19 at the time. Yeah. So it was just, oh these gosh. numbers were like, you know, I started to realize these are pretty good. I would post them on YouTube and that was before there was any lifting footage on YouTube. So, or not much, there was, there was a little bit and I realized like my deadlift in particular was at the top of the range as far as what was out there. So it started to what take- What year was all know, this? People. This was 2010. I graduated high school and went off to college. So um, I got a lot of attention on like the bodybuilding.com forums, which it was like complete debauchery on there. It was, it was crazy, but um, <laughs> that that got me a lot of attention early on. And that kind of is how my YouTube took off. Did you, uh, did you grow up in Wisconsin? Yes, sir. So I was uh, born in Madison, and then I lived about 30 minutes outside of there in oh, like a town of a thousand people, Cambridge. A really small high school, graduating class of like 67 people, and just grew up in this small town. So by the time I graduated, I was ready to go off to college to, you know, go back to Madison, big city, huge campus, you know, nightlife, all that sort of stuff. And I got into like bouncing, being a doorman. I was up till like 3 a.m. every night. Uh, just it was like a complete 180 from high school where like I almost felt invisible in high school. But then I got to college and you're like the doorman at the most popular bar in, in Madison. So everyone respects you. All the football players want to be your friend. Like you become this huge icon. Everyone's looking up to you. Um, everybody, you know, it's just it's just it was wild. So. That was addicting as well. And then that's kind of like how I got into anabolic steroids where I just, I started taking them at age 20 and everything just blew up from there. The attention, the, the competitions, the numbers, all that. It was just, it's like a, it's like a blur to look back on because it all came on so quickly. Damn, dude. The, I think the confidence that comes with exercising, whether it's lifting or running, like, it's so huge. Like I, I, I feel like I've heard that a similar story from a lot of people where like they, they weren't like bullied necessarily or they, they just weren't like the popular kid because they were scrawny. They didn't really do a whole lot. And then they got, got into lifting and they started running really fast or doing some sort of athletic achievements. And like, then all of a sudden they have this confidence because people are like respecting them more. And I think like, if, if more of that was encouraged with like kids and, and you know, younger kids in middle school, high school, I think, we could get rid of a lot of the like mental health problems and, you know, a lot of the, 
like more negative things that happen at that age, just by, you know, people getting out and, and exercising and building that confidence. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a great story though. I, I think the, the, uh, the bouncing position is probably perfect for a guy like you. I mean, you're just a massive power lifter dude. Like <laughs> that's a, that's a perfect job for you in, in college. Well, at the time I was completely introverted. I didn't have, I never partied, nothing like that. I didn't really have friends. So going from that to a position where you have to interact with hundreds of people every night, that kind of brought out the, you know, the social skills, so to speak. Like I I had to to learn real, real fast on the fly, how to talk to people all night long, being around hundreds, hundreds of people. You're making all these friends, you know, everybody's trying to be your friends. So they have like special privileges and stuff like that. So that got me out of my shell. To where, you know, even nowadays, I'm very confident with like public speaking, giving presentations, things like that, uh, seminars, whatever. And a lot of that is because for those like three years, I was just interacting with people all night long. And so that went, that took me from like this introvert to where I'd still probably say I was an introvert, but I was able to uh, to be more extroverted and kind of break out of that shell. And the confidence came from that. And then the lifting helped as well. You know, you see your body transform you see yourself put on all this muscle mass you see your strength rise up all these these crazy numbers and uh it definitely helped and i took it to the next level in an unhealthy manner to where you know age 20 getting on anabolic steroids probably not the wisest decision but that also helped with confidence to a degree um it also added to the in you know intimidation factor of like being a doorman and that sort of thing the whole look so Mm. i got up to about 260 pounds at one point and hitting hitting some crazy numbers uh like the squat got up to 772 pounds in knee sleeves um bench was 485 and then deadlift 920 pounds and this is just it was it was the whole deal it was it was addicting so steroids like were mentally addicting in that sense where the power you'd feel from them the confidence that sort of thing uh that also took things to the next level beyond just lifting itself and I'm I'm happy to say, obviously, we'll get into this, but I, I got, kind of got away from all that. Dude, those numbers are impressive. Uh, so was, you said 772 squat, 485 pound bench, 920 pound deadlift. That is, those are some insane numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, and you know, you can say like, obviously, a large part of that was steroids. There was, uh, you know, I, I did get to a 700 pound deadlift naturally. But bench was like 315 pounds prior to that. And squat was upper fives. It was like 580 high bar with no belt, no knee sleeves. Because I didn't even like know about knee sleeves at the time. And I was pretty much, I like to go beltless a lot. So the squat and deadlifts were pretty respectable even before that. But it definitely took things to the next level. I never deny that. I never deny what it does for your physique or strength or anything like that. I never downplay it very open about it so it was just a different time in my life but i was into that for nine years and that that definitely helped all the lifts nine years of steroids what what was like the peak of that like uh because i'm sure it's some like did you did you feel good on a day-to-day basis like i i have obviously never done steroids and i don't really know many people who have personally but like does it make you feel good like do you have a lot of energy like what is this what does that feel like Yeah, it became, it was so commonplace because the world I was in, as far as powerlifting, everybody was doing it. It wasn't a thing that was necessarily taboo at all because you were around all these freakish lifters. Like I was around guys who were way bigger than me even, who were, you know, the Lily Bridges, like they were monsters, they were huge and and guys like that. So the people I'd go against the competition, they were all, everybody was doing it. So it wasn't even out of the ordinary. We, We were all used to it. It just became our norm. Whereas now, I'm definitely not around it anywhere near as much. I've kind of gotten out of that whole, you know, powerlifting industry, so to speak. I'm I'm kind of pivoting a little bit. But as far as how I felt, I mean, from a health standpoint, you don't necessarily feel the best because you've got the high blood pressure. You've got the sleep apnea all the time. Mm -hmm. So you could sleep nine hours a night and you still feel not rested at all. Because your your neck size would literally get so big, you'd have so much muscle mass that you would have obstructive sleep apnea. So you're never feeling rested. You've always got the high blood pressure. 
you know, your blood work's always super out of whack. Um, so as far as that, you don't feel healthy, but you feel like this, you know, imposing figure everywhere you go where people just, you command respect in a sense. Uh, people look at you like, wow, that guy's huge or whatever. And it, that part is addicting, no doubt about it. Like that part, as far as feeling superhuman, that's an addicting feeling. Um, whereas now, like I feel normal, I'm, you know, 205 pounds. So it's like losing 50 pounds and all the muscle mass, a lot of it. And it's, it, you just feel like normal. Nobody looks at you like that anymore because you just have, uh, you look like you work out. So that it was, it was like a psychological thing more than anything where it would give you this feeling of power, but you really, I always felt, you know, semi unhealthy. And then if I got like close to a competition where I had a meet coming up and I was really pushing the, uh, the drugs at that point, I would feel like even more unhealthy where I could feel really nauseous from the amount or you just, you would feel off, but you were also your strongest. So like the stronger you'd get, the worse you'd almost feel. Interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected that. I would have imagined like, you know, testosterone's through the roof. Everything's all jacked up. Like, I feel like you'd have such energy all the time, but it doesn't sound like you would. No, I think it's a misconception where you know, you'd almost always feel more lethargic because you're in this unhealthy state. There's probably this high degree of inflammation. So something like your C-reactive protein would be through the roof, which is a, the systemic inflammation biomarker. You would get checked on blood work. That would be through the roof. Um, your lipids, as far as your like cholesterol and now apolipoprotein B, that'd be something you would check. I know I'm kind of probably going down the rabbit hole, of confusing people here, but this stuff would all be out of whack. All the health parameters you would look at, if you were to, to dive into them and kind of get a snapshot of how your health is, it would be a disaster. So you kind of ignore all that because you're in your 20s, you feel invincible and you just want to be strong. And nowadays, I've seen a lot of guys in the industry, you know, who have pushed it and ignored things like that. They get to their 30s and, you know, we're seeing it all the time every year. Guys in the industry, not just powerlifting, but the fitness industry are passing away. And this is just all every year. Every year, there's there's a couple big names and we don't even see the people who aren't big names who passed away from this lifestyle. So for me, you know, even now, it just got to a point where I was like, I can't keep living like this. I've seen people die. I've seen people die from this. I'm not going to ignore it. And that's kind of how I got on this other path. That's scary, man. Is it, uh, is it usually something to do with uh, like a cardiac related thing, like cardiac arrest or, or something along those lines or like the high blood pressure? Do you know what it usually is that, that ends up killing those people? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you basically nailed it. It's mainly heart related a lot of times. That's where this stuff messes you up. So there's no doubt about it. I mean, you can get away with a lot in your 20s. And for me, it was anabolic steroids. I didn't partake in alcohol. I've never really drank. I didn't do any recreational drugs ever. Didn't even smoke weed, like nothing like that. But this was my drug of choice was anabolic steroids. I love being strong. I love getting as strong as possible. That was the goal at the time. I was going to do whatever it took to get as strong as possible. Nothing was going to stop me. So you throw caution to the wind. You ignore your health. You don't worry about all that. Because really, in your 20s, I mean, I know you're in your 20s now, but at that point, I felt like I'm not going to die. No, you know, nothing's going to happen to me. And then I actually saw, you know, a few years later, I saw some guys die like in their 20s and it kind of woke me up. Um, there's, there's so many guys where I've like trained around them or I've interacted with them, whether it's texting online or whatever, and now they're not here. And it's like, Jeez. you can't keep ignoring that. Uh, back in, in 2010, there really wasn't much information out there. Like people didn't think this stuff was that detrimental. And now like we are seeing it year in and year out where people are having heart attacks or the, the blood pressure related problems. There's, a, there's been a lot of aneurysms, um, you know, just in the news in the last week was that guy, Joe Aesthetics. I, I don't, I forget his name. He's like a, he had 8 million Instagram followers, like a big bodybuilding scene guy, very shredded. And he passed away from an aneurysm, which it's like, it may or may not directly be attributed to that sort of stuff, but he was in the industry. He was in the, the same kind of stuff. So I just, I mean, Rich Piana, like you, we could just name, name after name. There, Mr. Olympia, Sean Roden from like a couple of years ago passed away. Uh, Jerry Ward, Boston Lloyd. Like I could just keep naming people to where it's like a huge wake up call. 
it's like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to keep taking this stuff. Uh, I'm not going to keep going down that road. And it was, uh, it was a wild ride, but I think a lot of guys now just keep, get caught up in it and they stay within that, that role. They, they stay on that path and then it's too late. And I don't, I don't want to be a, another statistic. Damn, dude, that's, that's so sad. Uh, and, and I'm sure so much of it is due, like you, you kind of mentioned earlier, of like the peer pressure almost of like, or maybe not peer pressure, but like just the normalization of it within the lifting community. Uh, and even like, it makes me think of like the, the Tour de France, like when Lance Armstrong was at his peak, like, yes, he, he obviously got caught doping, but like I, I read something that like, if you had to go down the list to like the guy that got like 20th place in the Tour de France to find the first clean guy. And it's just like, when everybody's doing it, it's so easy to justify you doing it also. Um, do you feel like there's going to come a time where like people, like everybody kind of wakes up to the dangers of it, more knowledge about it. And then people just stop using that stuff. Or do you think it'll always kind of be a part of the sport? Yeah, I think it'll always be a part of the sport be because people want to push things to the extreme. They want to get as strong as possible. So they're going to do whatever it takes. I think there's more education nowadays. There's more information out there. Um, as far as there should be a point where you call it quits with that. So I think guys are going to dabble in it, but they might be more responsible in the sense that they'll narrow that window of time that they're doing so. Where they'll be like, okay, I'm turning 30 now. I need to chill out on this stuff and not do it anymore. Uh, that's the biggest change where I think people won't push it as long. And that was kind of the case with me where it's like, I was turning 29 and I'm like, I got to stop with this. This is, you know, this is not going to be a good decision going into my thirties. And there was a lot more information out at the time. So it will dissuade some people, but at the same time, you are not as receptive to the message when you are say, you know, 20 years old or, or 23 years old, you're, you're more likely to, to push it. Um, and now too, like, People want that, that bigger following and the way to do that in powerlifting is to be the strongest like that, get that Instagram following or whatever, you know, put up crazy numbers. So there's more pressure in that, from that side to like really take everything and get as strong as possible and grow your following. If you're trying to go down that road. Do they test for, for that stuff in powerlifting or is there like similar to bodybuilding where there's like a natural class you can be a part of, or how does that work with powerlifting? Yeah, powerlifting is the exact same thing where there is the natural side of things, natural. So I honestly, I would call it drug tested because a lot of people are slipping through the cracks with the drug testing and they don't drug test like that many people. But USAPL is what the drug tested side of things is, IPF. And then there's also the untested side. So I was a part of obviously the untested side, which was huge as well. Like there were tons of people competing untested and you could go to one of these meets and none of us at the time, like nobody looked normal. Like you, everybody's freaking huge, just massive traps, massive backs. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy now to look back on. Cause I, I'll even look back at like video or pictures of myself. And I'm like, I can't even believe I looked like that because it's so far from how things you are, are now. Huge, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy though, because I can't even picture myself being like that person. It just is like. It, it blows my mind. I can't, I can't imagine the weights or anything like that. I'm like in a different place in life. Um, but yeah, there's big business in the untested side of things where it's like, it's expected that everybody's going to take stuff and that's just how it is. Do you have any regrets of, of doing it? Like, obviously you pumped your numbers up so big, like these just incredible, uh, lifts that you had. Like if you could go back and do it again, would you not? take steroids or, or do you think you would do it all over again the same way? I think I would have, uh, that's a tough question because I can't say that I wouldn't have taken them, but I would have gone about it in a much more responsible manner as far as dosing when I started, what age, instead of starting at say age 20, wait a couple of years, not do as rough of compounds like Trenbolone. Trenbolone is like the, the steroid that gets all the attention. It's ridiculous. Um, it's where roid rage comes from, aggression, all that sort of stuff. 
And I, I probably wouldn't have done that as extensively, obviously. I would have gotten blood work over all those years on cycle to kind of see where things were at. So I, I can't say that I would have not done it, but I would have done it much more responsibly if that's a, if that's a thing. I would have done it later in life, a little later, and for a smaller period, a shorter period of time, a smaller window. So there's things I would have done differently, but at the same time, it was uh, a lot of a lot of where I'm at today is due to what I was doing when I was on it, like the the numbers I hit, the opportunities I had, getting flown to France a couple times to lift, getting flown all over the U.S. to lift, all the opportunities, the animal cage, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know if it would have been there had I not gone down that road. So there's not necessarily regrets, but I could have done it a lot better, a lot more efficiently and a lot healthier. So when you were doing it, did you have help from like a, a doctor or physician or was it just like you buy it from a friend who might have had it, you know, got a prescription or, or how does that, how did that work? Yeah, it's like a whole underground industry it's it's all black market for the most part it there's a lot better quality stuff out there now but back then there's there's no doctor i didn't anytime i go to a doctor they'd look at me and i'd get some lecture about how i shouldn't be taking steroids obviously because they could just look at me and know what you're doing and i just didn't want to hear it i wasn't receptive to that message i don't want to hear that when i'm trying to push things to an extreme level of strength so there's no doctor involvement. It's just like, you know, people who either know people or they're making it themselves at their house. They're ordering like they order this raw, the raw powder from China, the raw powder form, and they'll make it like it's cooked up. It's like a whole cooking process. Right. And you get it from somebody like that black market. And that's how all of it was made underground. Um, and when I got towards the end, I got approached by like big business uh, drug dealers, basically like, like, like drug dealers, they only dealt steroids, but I'm talking like multi-million dollar operations, big time operations where they would reach out Jeez. to you. Like we'll sponsor you. We'll hook you up with whatever you want, whenever you want for free. Um, we just need like word of mouth referral. Like that's how they grow their business. So they would sponsor like the best guys and it would be the best, highest quality gear, highest quality steroids. And, uh, that, that came later on. It was like, instead of getting it just from some guy who you knew where you didn't know the quality of it. And I dealt with crazy stuff, like crazy infections, bad shots, where I couldn't walk for like a week. I would be limping around. Um, terrible acne. It was it was freaking brutal, dude. Worst acne you've ever seen. That stuff was all from like unclean steroids. But later on, I was getting like the best stuff because I was I was in contact with these big time like drug dealers, who were, like big time, and it was still anonymous, but they were you knew they were dealing like millions, millions of dollars yeah, worth of stuff. That's crazy, man. That's a that's a whole like you said underground industry that like I I've never heard of any of that. So it's it's fascinating, but it's like it's kind of scary at the same time that like there's all this shit happening. Um, and people have access to that stuff and you know, it's similar. It reminds me of like the, like the narcotic industry too. It's like all this stuff you buy off the streets and like, I don't think people are lacing steroids, but like, you know, like you just don't know where it's coming from or somebody's probably cooking it up in their basement or something. And like you, you inject the wrong shit on accident. Like, I don't know if that's common or not, but I'd always be worried about that. Dude. Oh dude. I got a crazy story. Oh my God. All right. Um, well the guy at the end. Where I was getting, like, he, he had the huge operation. His stuff I knew was amazing. Like, I knew it was top quality, clean, the best stuff. And he got busted. He got taken down by the feds. Feds got him in uh, December yeah. of 2020. Yeah, I think he went down December 2020. Or maybe it was December 2021. I can't remember. But the feds got him. And he was dealing huge quantities. He had guys under him. So it's like a system where you're, you're talking to the head guy. He's got guys running under him, cooking up. He's got a system in place. He had like ripped off the PayPal logo and made it like Juice Pal. It was hilarious. That was his brand. But um, yeah, it's freaking funny, man. It was great stuff. But um, really nice guy too. Never knew who he was, but he was nice. Like you'd interact with him over encrypted emails. Uh, it's crazy. But no, like before that, 
there were, you know, you, you wouldn't know exactly the quality or where it's coming from. So like, that's how I would get these insane side effects. For me, the acne was awful. Like cystic acne, nasty, man. It was brutal. Um, had that bad shots where you'd get these infections. It was just, it was awful. And then one time, this is some crazy stuff. Like this guy sent me freaking, because people are always trying to send you stuff. If you get to a level where you're at like the top of the sport and you're one of the strongest, everybody's always trying to give you free stuff. So they would send me like, right. this, this one guy sent me free gear, a bunch of, bunch of steroids. And he included in a bag, like a Ziploc bag, he included some pills. And my, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, dude. So I didn't know what I was looking at. I'm like naive. I'm thinking these pills are the steroids, Anadrol and Anavar. I'm thinking like it's just more oral steroids pill form. And so I took one of them. There were like probably six pills in the bag. Oh, no. I took one of them. Freaking passed out, dude. Like passed out in my apartment. I'm alone. Don't remember anything. Woke up. So I don't even know how much time went by. Hours. And like at the time, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, she had like come to my apartment, knocked on my door. I never heard anything. I was completely out of it. Just woke up like however many hours had passed. Didn't know what happened. So like I started to piece it together and I'm like, these are not steroids. Like they threw some drugs in. Like, I don't, like, I don't know what they were, like, they're trying to, like, give me sampler packs of rec drugs, and I didn't know what the heck I took. I think <laughs> it was, God. I think it was, this is my suspicion now. I've thought about this for a long time because I passed out so hard. I think it was a, um, in, oh, what the heck is that called? A Xanax laced with fentanyl. So, I think that's what was going on with that. I literally think it was an, it was a fake, um, street xanax that had fentanyl in it i swear on my life so oh my god i scared the cra i literally was like dude i was this close to dying holy crap because i kid you not i almost took like three of them at once because i was like thinking they're steroids and you just take a mass amount at the time you just take a bunch and some of the other i know in in hindsight some of the other drugs in there were uh ecstasy it was mdma so it was mdma and it was street Xanax, which probably a fentanyl. And that's why I think I just blacked out like 30 minutes after I took it. I don't remember anything. So I was 250, 60 pounds at the time. So that might have saved me to where it was like not as yeah. much for my body weight. But dude, if I would have taken all of it, I would have been dead. And like it, I realized this. I was like, holy crap, I got to be way more careful. I could have just popped all these and, and killed myself. Uh, and I was like 25. Like, it was, like, scary. It's a wake-up call. Like, you better Dude. know what you're taking. Yeah. Crazy. That's wild, man. That That's a, that's such a crazy world, man. That's, um, I don't even know what to say to that. That's it. I mean, I'm glad you're here now. I'm glad you didn't uh, <laughs> take the three the three pills like you planned on. Um, That's scary, though, man. I mean, it's uh, just that whole world of, of drugs and, and, you know, getting all this shit from people you don't really know. Like, you just can't trust anything, really. Um, no. What is your your take on like uh like TRT versus versus like anabolics? Yeah, I mean TRT has legitimacy. Where I know tons of people on TRT just from their doctor, obviously. Like they they go into the doctor and they get two hundred milligrams of testosterone, typically, uh, at least around here, which which can put you at like a crazy high testosterone level. So right now my testosterone level is five hundred nanograms per deciliter. And I know people where they'll take 200 milligrams of testosterone from TRT and they'll be at like 2000. So four times, oh my you know, a normal level of like what you or I would have. And it's crazy, but I think it's, it's a little overblown. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for, for people, but I also think people jump to it like way prematurely where they think I need TRT and, and they get a crazy high dose. And then they got these test levels of like 2000, which is way above normal. So it depends on the doctor, how much they're prescribing, things like that. I don't think it's really that necessary, especially for guys who are younger, but it's become huge business. It's huge business. That's why we see it all the time. Yeah. It seems like, uh, more people are taking it like when they're like in their late thirties, forties, like when they're, when they're 
natural tea starts to dip down. Um, and that's where you see like a 50 year old dude that's just absolutely shredded to pieces. Uh, at, at least from my knowledge, it's usually TRT. Um, what was that, that process like of getting off of the steroids? Like, did you have like withdrawals of any kind? Did you like lose your strength really quickly? Like what did that whole process look like? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, I'd say for about, it took about two years to kind of get back to normal as far as how my body felt, the hormones and all that sort of thing, because it's been about two and a half years now. So I came off in November of 2020 and it was a lot of ups and downs. It was a roller coaster. Um, lost all my strength, more or less. All my numbers dipped down to nothing, just lost it all. And it was tough mentally just to, to get that much weaker, see all your muscle kind of kind of shrink away and, and feel off and have no libido and, and all that sort of thing. It was tough. Um, and that's why a lot of people won't do it because it's not this smooth process where you're like, okay, I'm going to come off everything and then in six months I'll be feeling good. It's like you're going to not feel right for years. It's going to take a year or two to get back to where you feel normal. And I didn't feel depressed necessarily. Um, I didn't feel, you know, like I didn't have energy in my day to day. It wasn't like that. Like I still felt like I had energy to get my work done and all that. But the strength was gone. I'd go in the gym. I'd get sore from doing one set. I could do one set of deadlift and I'd be completely shot. I'd be so sore I couldn't do anything else. Wow. Um, psychologically, like losing your sense of identity because that's what everybody's always known you for and complimented you for and all that sort of thing. That's what you've grown your following with. That's tough. That was tough to, to lose it all as far as this is what people know me for and I'm just not doing it anymore. Um, that's been, that's still kind of a, a pivoting process where it's, it's hard because everyone who came up with me knew me from that. And now my numbers aren't at that point where they're that impressive. So people aren't, you know, it's, it's like having to, to, to find out an entire new viewership base. So it's tough. It's tough in a lot of ways. I mean, that's how I make a living. I coach people on how to get stronger and it's just, it's a whole process. It's been a whole process, which is why you like almost never see anyone do it. They'll either stay on TRT where you can maintain that size and muscle mass and, and kind of do so in a healthier manner, but coming completely off, not TRT, nothing. It's, it's, it's not done because it is such a long process and it's, it wears on you. So now two and a half years later, I feel awesome. My blood work is great. My health is great. I, I look, um, I'm about to be 32 years old in a month and I look younger than I did when I was like 23, which is crazy because the steroids have that profound of an effect where your skin is not healthy. Mm. They age you, they age your organs, all that sort of stuff. So I'm hoping I've reversed a lot of that. Like my biomarkers are really, really good, but it's uh, it's wild. It's wild how much that stuff ages you. That's crazy, man. I mean, where it, it turns into like, because that stuff is such a big part of your identity, the, these huge lifts and just being massive, like where you had to make a health decision, but then it ultimately kind of became like a business decision. It's like, do I do I want my business to suffer? And I just continue down this path of like, having negative effects on my health or do I like, you know, make this decision to, you know, be around for my family longer and risk maybe losing some business. That's a really hard decision to make. Yes. And that's exactly how it's been where it's, I got to a point, I was like, I have to make the decision for myself. I'm like, I, I could keep going the way I'm going with powerlifting and being huge and all that, but it's, it might kill me. So what's the point of that? And really the decision, the catalyst, for coming off everything was having a kid. Um, I wanted to have a child and it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, it can happen. People have had kids with no fertility, essentially with their, their FSH and LH completely shut down their, their, you know, all that sort of stuff. It, it, you can still have a kid, you know, all it takes is one, right? But it's very unlikely. So I came off to have a kid seven months after coming off. My wife was pregnant, so we made it happen. I now have like a 15-month-old daughter, and I just stayed off after that. From a health standpoint, I was like, I'm going to stay off. I don't want to kill myself with this stuff. And uh, it's been tough with business. I, I still do well, but as far as like my following, definitely taking a hit. It's definitely, it's like pivoting completely. 
where people are like, what is this about? Like now that it's, there are a lot of people who are still very behind you and they're, they're, they're super into the health side of things. And they like the combination of the hybrid athlete with the running and, and being strong. But there's a lot of people who are like, not about it. They just want to see you as strong as possible. They, they are not into this. So it's funny because you'll see like Instagram followers going down still, but YouTube actually grows, but, uh, but it'll get to a point where it stabilizes obviously. And then it might take off again, but it, it's been, it's been interesting to see the, the demographic shift and all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it's like, I want to be around for a while. I want to be healthy. I want to thrive. I want to be here for my daughter, my wife. So I had to make that call where I had to look at things from a long-term growth standpoint, as opposed to the short term. It's like, I might take a hit short term as far as business, as far as growth, but it's going to pay off in the long term and I can, I can pivot to a new audience. Yeah. I, th I think that transition period, any, any transition or change in life is so hard and it's, it's so challenging um, to go through that. And like you said, it's like, do I, do I sacrifice the short term for the long term? And I think, you know, that's how most decisions should be made. Um, and, and, you know, I think too, like when it comes to social media, like obviously you built a big following from posting these just massive lifts showing how you're, you're getting stronger and, and lifting more. Um, but like, there's an audience for everything, in my opinion, like there's an audience for people who lift heavy. There's an audience for people who run fast or who run far, or, you know, there's a, a combo of both. Like, I think that, you know, like you said, you might lose some followers or, or some of that engagement in the short term, but like, as you just keep, you know, being your genuine self, showing your journey and, and like how you're transitioning, I think just being open and authentic with that. Like, I mean, I was attracted to you because like, I heard you had a cool story. You had like did this whole powerlifting journey with, with steroids and then you had to transition out of it. And now you're getting more into running. Like, I think that'll resonate with so many people. And I think it's just a matter of time of like acquiring those new people and, and that new audience and, you know, just letting people find out who you are, um, from a new perspective. Uh, so I think, again, it's just a short term versus long term decisions. Yeah. I mean, now where my passion is at truthfully it's not in having the most massive lifts possible or being as big as possible. It's my, my passion. Like what gets me up is, you know, some of these bucket list goals I've had from running or as far as running that I had 15 years ago and, and achieving certain times in like the marathon, half marathon, that sort of thing. And being as healthy as possible. That's the cool thing with running, running ties directly into health. So the faster you get, the better shape you get in, the better your health is. I mean, Peter Atia, he's been talking about this for the last two years, where he's been mm -hmm. hyping up VO2 max like crazy. As VO2 max is like, he's always talking about the number one thing that tells you how healthy you are. So he's always like, you got to achieve the highest mm -hmm. VO2 max possible, and you're going to be the lowest risk possible for all-cause mortality. Where having an elite VO2 max, he said, lowers your all-cause mortality from heart disease, metabolic disease, cancer, all that sort of stuff, five times. And so it's kind of cool where it's like, I can become healthier and get as healthy as possible while getting faster. So it's almost like the faster I get with running, the better shape I get in, the lower body fat, I'm going to be healthier. And I've seen it. I've got blood work done in April and I was like 222 pounds at the time. Now I'm 205 pounds. So I'm actually going to get some more blood work coming Jeez. up here this month. Yeah. And, and, so I, I've lost since I started running 38 pounds, but the blood work at 222 pounds even was way better. And this was after I'd say roughly three months of, or two months of running. And my fasted insulin was like the lowest possible. So that basically means your in insulin sensitivity, which is what you want, was as high as possible. So insulin resistance is what kills you. That's metabolic disease, diabetes, that sort of thing. Think of it like that. Insulin resistance leads to diabetes and a whole host of other problems. Insulin sensitivity is what you want. You want to be as insulin sensitive as possible. So you want your insulin number on a blood panel to be as low as possible. And mine was just like stupid low. You couldn't even get it any lower. And that I credit 100% to running. My um, Another one we'll look at, it's called apo, apo lipoprotein B. And it is basically the new version of cholesterol. It's the new biomarker they look at. It has a much greater 
predict predictor as far as heart disease, heart attacks, that sort of thing. It's way more important than LDL and HDL. That that is kind of outdated now. HDL and LDL that I found doesn't actually predict that accurately um, the kind of shape your heart's in or your chance of heart disease. So they look at apolipoprotein B now, and you can get these checked very cheap. It's literally like $15 test. And that is a much greater predictor of, of heart health. And mine was also super low. I was at 85, um, really good number without any medication. I'm not on any medication. I take natural supplements, vitamins and such. But all of these numbers, the point is, were crazy healthy, like as, as healthy as you could possibly be. And I attribute that 100% to having low body fat and getting into running. So it's like cardiovascular exercise is a game changer. It's what's going to keep everybody around. It's going to keep you healthy. It's going to keep you living a long life. So I 100% believe that having an elite VO2 max and getting as low body fat as possible and doing cardiovascular exercise, running or not, like those are, those are the keys. So it, it, I'm like, why wouldn't I lean into this? Why wouldn't I try to get faster? Why wouldn't I try to get in better shape and then lose weight and all that sort of stuff? And it got rid of my sleep apnea. So for me, running has been like this transformative process that's completely changed my life, even in a five month, less than five month time span where my blood work is impeccable. I, I got rid of my sleep apnea. I'm the leanest I've been in probably like 15 years. I look way younger. My skin is, is way more clear. So it's like I attribute this all to running. That's what I love about it. It just transforms your health. And I still lift, obviously, but it's like. I'm I'm so blown away by how much running has done for my health. Blown away. Damn. Well, if anybody listening to this wasn't sold on running yet, I think you just sold them on it. <laughs> that was that was good, man. I think uh one question I had while you're talking is like did you do any sort of cardio when you were doing powerlifting or was like 5 months ago when you first got into running? Was that like really your first experience at cardio? Yeah, that was it. I never did cardio that whole time. I never did cardio. I mean, I had the background to where when I was 15 years old, just to, to kind of do it, I trained for five months for a marathon. I ran a 424, very slow. Um, but after that, I there mean, was no cardio. That's not, I would say that's slow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, see, by my standards now, I'm like, okay, that's not great. But um you know, since then, like the last 15 years after that, zero cardio. So that's where I basically went, you know, a decade with sleep apnea. I went with high blood pressure, with with everything being in an unhealthy state. So now it's kind of like an overcompensation effect where I'm like, I need to get as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. And I've become obsessed with getting my body fat as low as possible. I'm going to get it checked actually in like the next week or so as well going to try to get a pretty accurate picture i have a guess of where it's at but i want to i want to know for sure and uh get the blood work i'm always looking at that i'm completely obsessed with health now fascinated by it i've uh, i've learned from from some very knowledgeable people who kind of took me under their wing taught me everything I've, I've i'm very well versed in like blood work biomarkers that sort of thing and i just i it's almost like a different kind of personal record PR for me where it used to be like, okay, I'm going to hit a, a heavier lift, a PR on my lift. Now it's like, I got to get my blood work to where it's like a PR where it's as dialed in as possible so that I know I'm in like a healthy range and that's become kind of a new obsession. So it all ties together. It's where it's like, I'm crossing off bucket list things with running. I'm getting in better shape. I'm still lifting. I'm just not anywhere near as strong, but I'm still trying to maintain my strength. That's still kind of the foundation the, the pursuit of strength never goes away, but instead of chasing, say, like a 500-pound bench, it's like, okay, I'm going to work really hard to try to get like a 350 bench. And now I'm at 315. 315 is like hard, but I want to get to 350, and we'll see if that's possible. So it's it's numbers that are a lot more attainable for you know everybody because you can relate to it. You don't need steroids. I'm not on testosterone. Right. I take vitamin D, vitamin K2, uh, vitamin B complex, iron. Iron bisglycinate, and then uh, I take uh, vitamin C in the form of Kamu Kamu. But that's it. Those are the supplements, like vitamins, apple cider vinegar. So it's it's a lot more relatable, though, I think, for people to be like, okay, I can be healthy. I can have a pretty good physique. 
Um, three fifteen bench. It's it's a high number, but it's not crazy. It's not outlandish. It's not something unachievable, unattainable. And I think that that's going to resonate better with people than seeing like a five hundred pound bench where it's like, well, yeah, but you're obviously juicing and you know not in a healthy state. So that's kind of cool. Where I think in that way it might help the following long term because it is more relatable. Yeah, I feel like that obsession too with uh, with like your metabolic numbers rather than like a weight in the gym or a time running like like those are good benchmarks as well but like that pursuit of like always keeping your body in optimal condition is going to be i think way better because like it's so much more subjective like i could see you do a 315 bench and then i could try for years and years and years and never get there because of you know genetic limitations or something and it's like then i'm gonna be mad at myself and you know have a lot of negative thoughts because i'm like i'll never be as good as pete at bench but like instead if you compare yourself to your own self and like you know looking at your numbers um and that's also going to force you to just optimize everything instead of like you know it's going to be hyper focused on something usually but like not hyper focused on just bench press but like am i sleeping well am i am i like doing cardio am i eating well all these other things that would go into actual metabolic health too so i think that's that's like what I've never thought about it that way, but I think that's one of the best obsessions you can have when it comes to health. Yeah. It's just this balance of, I want to still be strong and with a mainly a focus on bench and deadlift. Those are the two lifts that I want to be as high as possible. I don't even care about squat anymore. Um, and I want to be faster. I want to get faster. I have goal times for, you know, different distances racing wise. And then I want my, my blood work to be as good as possible. So those are kind of all the, the focus is I'm trying to blend together and, you know, I, I have the same thing. I'll look at times you're hitting and, and the other guys and I'm like, man, I can't even fathom that, um, 250 marathons. Like this is crazy to me. So I, I think it is tough to somewhat be like keeping the comparison at bay and just trying to improve on your own times and your own strength numbers and all that. But it is good to have, to have, uh, people you look up to for motivation like I do with right. you and you're running. It's just like crazy speed. I can't, I can't imagine, but I don't let it discourage me. I'm just like, wow, that's really cool. And uh, it, it kind of motivates you. Exactly. Yeah. Using the comparison to others, like in a positive way of like, oh, I want to get there someday. Not like looking at it, you know, from a negative light of, oh, I'm not as good as this person. So I, I think, yeah, it's a good way of looking at it. Um, What was that experience like, or that, that kind of journey like when you first got into running like was it challenging going from like because i mean obviously powerlifting is so different from running so what was what was that journey like getting into running yeah it was tough because back in february i was 240 pounds so i i remember the first time i just tried a mile on the treadmill and i was dying i, I didn't have any incline <laughs> on the treadmill and it was like 13 minutes or so I don't know something like that and I was just dying I was out of breath and I trained on the treadmill for like the first two months and I would only do like two three miles a day um and it just the weight started to kind of come off gradually and then I finally built up some confidence where I was like all right I'm gonna try going outside and I battled shin splints that were just crippling for about four months mm -hmm. the first four months because I was heavy I had zero foundation and that really made things difficult. I was wearing worn out shoes. I put like 600 miles on one pair of shoes and that didn't help. <laughs> and just these, these things like that. It was, so it, it kicked my butt like early on. Um, and you looking back now, even looking back at like February and March, I'm like, wow, I've come really far. The only downside now is that the humidity and dew point and all that is insane, which makes it harder to run. But the, uh, the speed is, is, is way better at two of 205 pounds. You know, I've gotten down actually one day I hit 200 pounds, which was like crazy for me. Cause I was like, I haven't been 200 pounds since high school. Um, so that was pretty cool, but losing the body weight has been a huge thing. That's been a huge key. That's really helped the running process. Has a, uh, do you know, I know you track like body fat percentage and, and like your, your muscle index. Like, is that 30 plus pounds that you've lost? Is that, pure obviously it's not gonna be pure fat but is it mostly fat or did, have you lost quite a bit of muscle too yeah i'd say um i'd say a combination of both because you're definitely gonna shed muscle i mean you can't lose that much weight in that short short of a time period 
to where it's not going to affect things, but I'm way leaner than I was. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'm definitely in the single digits at this point, which is, which is really nice. And cause I, that's the other thing, like from a running economy standpoint, I still have quite a bit of muscle mass and I don't want to get rid of all that. So I look at it like, well, how am I going to get faster by getting as lean as possible? So I've tried to gradually get leaner and leaner because I still want to hold quite a bit of muscle, which is, you know, any body weight's going to slow you down to an extent. Um, but I've definitely, like, my lifts have, have fallen off. Even off steroids, I was benching 390 pounds at 240, and now it's 315. And, like, deadlift was uh, 705, and it got down to, like, 630. And then I tried 650 and, like, injured my back a, a month ago. But it's still good numbers, but it's, it's still a huge drop-off. So it's a little bit of both. I'd say it's more fat than muscle, but you still, you're going to lose both. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's like, you know, do you want to be great at one thing or do you want to be like pretty good at several things or multiple things? And so I think that's you know, kind of what you have to ask yourself is like, you know, like, do I want to like thrive in lifting or do I want to thrive in running or do I want to be like decent at both? And I think it, you know, sounds like following that hybrid style is be decent at both and be able to, to go into the gym and lift pretty heavy and then still go run and be able to run pretty quickly as well. Um, and the way I like to look at muscle and like body weight when it comes to running is like functional body mass versus non-functional body mass as it pertains to running so it's like yes being lighter will make you faster it's like you know look at an elite marathon runner like their skin and bones basically but they all strength train still and they're still strong it's just like they've gotten rid of all of that non-functional body mass you know the first thing to go is gonna be fat obviously and the next is like you don't really need a lot of upper body muscle for running I mean, if you want the aesthetics or if you want to still be strong in those areas, but like, you know, again, you just have to ask yourself, like, what are my ultimate goals? Like, am I trying to run a two thirty marathon? Then yeah, you're probably going to have to lose a little bit of muscle, unfortunately. But, um, I don't know. I mean, there's people out there like Patrick Cutter. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I'm sure you'd love him if, if you don't know him yet, but he's, I think he's close to 200, maybe like 190, and he's just jacked. And I think he runs like a two. 33 234 marathon like it's yeah. it's nuts man there are definitely anomalies out there people like that who can be big have a lot of muscle and still just move their body and the thing i'm starting to find out too personally is like it just takes time like he's done patrick i think he's done like over 20 marathons or something so he's been doing it for years and years and it just it's like your body just like anything it just takes time for it to acclimate to whatever style of training you're trying to do yeah you i think there was a guy who did Boston with you. You talked to him at some point. Um, I think he's over in like New York. The guy, the guy who did construction and he's like 205. He's like 205 pounds. Oh, uh, Frankie? Yeah, that guy is 205 pounds body weight, pretty jacked, and he's doing like a three-hour marathon. It's like, wow, holy yep. cat. So it can be done. Um, this is cool to see because I'm 205 pounds now. So it's it's like, wow, this guy's the same way and he's pulling a th sub three. Uh marathon which that's that's crazy to me that's crazy speed but it shows it can be done right yeah and the interesting thing like in my experience too is uh my very first marathon i was trying to break three hours uh i dropped weight because i thought that's what i had to do to run faster and so i got down my natural weight's like 170 ish and i dropped down like 152 wow. like like low 150s like way too small i was always injured felt like shit all the time didn't run the time I wanted to. Uh, and then over a year later, I went back up to more my natural weight. So around 170, ran Boston and had like a 10 minute PR essentially. And just felt way better, way stronger. And it's like, again, I think what that testifies to is just the time spent training, doing the balancing of lifting and running and, and just getting your body acclimated to that. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's there's a shift starting to happen um, of people being able to run faster and, and be big and strong too. I think for the longest time, people just didn't know it was possible. And now there's been definitive right. proof. We've seen enough people do it who have a lot of muscle mass to where it's like, okay, you can have quite a bit of muscle mass and still have pretty good times. I mean, I know your goal is the 245, which is just insane. Like that, that's got to come out to about a 615 pace. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I can't even, <laughs> I couldn't imagine running that for like three miles and you're just, I don't know. That's crazy. That's just another level, but I know you've built up to it. So I get that. That's part of the game. 
yeah, dude, I mean, it's just like, you know, you're not going to get into powerlifting and six months later, you know, hit a 900 pound deadlift. It takes a decade of, of working at it. So it, it's the same thing. It's, uh, you know, just takes time. Um, I, I do want to ask you like some like comparison questions between like the running community and the powerlifting community. Uh, now that you've gotten into the running community more, uh, are there any similarities or differences between the communities? I think the powerlifting community, I mean, it was a lot more, <laughs> at least what I was in, it was, it was, it was more cutthroat in the sense where it was like everybody was on anabolics and that sort of thing. And, uh, very intense, but it's weird because I haven't like integrated into the running community that much where I'm not, I'm, uh, for me, it's even like a very, I know you're really good with this as far as integrating everybody going on group runs and that, but I'm, I'm very much like a loner as far as it, I go run by myself and, um, I post about it, but it's a, it's a different, more health conscious group, obviously it's, uh, but I can't say I'm that deep into it. Like I'm, I'm still learn. I'm still very new to it. I'm just scratching the surface of it, but obviously I feel like people are more health conscious. They're trying to take care of themselves. Whereas with strength and powerlifting, it's a lot of, um, just whatever it takes and, and every man for himself <laughs> kind of thing. So. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can't say it because I've been in the lifting world very much, but I can definitely sense that like running, it's a, I don't know. It's, it's a different type of people or a different type of person that, that, runs obviously and um i don't know i i think that it's more like or the running community is just like it's very encouraging and welcoming i feel like i don't know how it is with powerlifting but i feel like with running it's uh it's just like super open i guess like doesn't matter what you look like how fast you run any of that stuff people are willing to like let you in and come run with them and and it's like oh we're all runners we're all suffering we're all doing the same thing I don't know. That's my experience with it, at least. Do you like running more with people or by yourself? I used to hate running with people because I think it was my ego, probably, of like, oh, I want to run my pace, do my thing. I don't care what other people are doing. And then over time, I think what what shifted a lot of a lot of it was like I learned it doesn't really matter how fast you're running for like 80% of your time that you're running. It's just like as long as you're getting the miles in. And so that was a good shift. Um to like, okay, I can let go of my ego and just like go run with people and have fun. And two, it's like, uh, we basically quit drinking. Um, and a lot of drinking obviously comes with like the social aspect. And like, if you want to see friends and go out and do stuff and be with people, you kind of have to go drink or go to a bar or restaurant or whatever. And I feel like with running, you get that same thing where you can go to a group run. You can go and hang out with people, socialize, but you don't have to drink and you're just there to you get a workout in, you can be healthier and, and you, and you get to socialize. Yeah, that makes sense. I I could definitely see that being a thing. I'll sometimes run with, with you know, my coach, but it's not 90% of the runs are by myself. And then sometimes you'll, you know, I mean, the, like the other day on my long run, I, I was just ended up running the same pace as this other guy. So we, he had earbuds in, we didn't even talk, but it was like a mutual thing. We're just like, all right, we're pretty much running the same pace. Like no talking, but like he gave me at the end, like a fist bump. I kept going, but it was funny because it just worked out. Like we were literally at the exact same pace. I'm like, all right. And uh, so that was kind of cool. That's but so cool. I think the another thing too, I like about running, it like allows me to feel like I can justify eating some, some bad food. <laughs> it's because I like to eat, yeah. <laughs> I like to eat good food. I like to eat pizza and uh, everything, ice cream, all that stuff. So after I've run a lot, I'm like, okay, I can definitely justify this more. Without it, you just kind of get huge. You blow up to back up to 240, but I kind of stay in a good weight range now. And I can go home at the end of the day after, after you know, 20,000 steps for that day or whatever. And I'm like, all right, I can justify eating this. Because I, I love food. That's one thing that's never going to yeah. change. Yeah, I mean, you're burning so many calories uh, that, like, it, it's okay. And you, you have to get in some sort of calories that, like, you know, once or twice a week, just go and binge and, it's going to be okay. It's all about moderation. I think, um, what, uh, what races are you training for right now? 
So the main focus, I'm doing roughly 40, 45 miles a week. And November 10th, I've got a half marathon. So obviously I could run a half marathon distance, no problem right now. But I want to hit a specific time. So the goal is sub 140. Comes out to like 737 pace. Um, and it's the Secret City Oak Ridge Half Marathon here, my hometown race. So that's that's kind of the focus right now where I'm just trying to build up the speed mainly. So I'm not logging crazy miles, but I'm trying to gradually get faster for that race. And then after that, there's going to be a good, I think it'll be roughly five month break where I will have April 7th, the Knoxville Marathon. So this will be my first go at a marathon in like 17 years. And I also, I want to do about th sub 320 for that. Um, that'll be about 14 months of training down. And I'm going to just keep hammering away. And that'll be, uh, those will be the main ones. And then, you know, we got something maybe up our sleeve after that. But <laughs> I, uh, I've got, I've got something in mind, uh, big bucket list thing that I've been thinking about for a long time. Years, in fact, but I, I'm kind of, I don't wanna really want to let the cat out of the bag now. Um, especially until I've signed up for this, this set event, we've talked a little bit, but I, I've got some, some ultra plans and things of that nature where I'll kind of let speed go at that point and just start blasting high mileage. But ultra running has always interested me. It's always been an interest where when I was a teenager, I was like subscribed to ultra running magazine. Like I would get it every month. I would follow Anton Krupichka. Oh, wow. I, I remember I, I figured out, I first learned of Goggins in like 2008 or nine when no one even, he wasn't even like famous oh, wow. at all. Like I knew about him. Yeah. I got into it with, when Dean Karnazes came out with Ultra Marathon Man, read all that, became obsessed with Western States, Badwater, all that sort of stuff. I was like a huge fan. So even though I wasn't doing it, I was like a massive fan of it. Um, and I've always thought, I'm like, I got I to gotta try some of this. Like at some point in my life, like the bucket list thing, I'm like, I got to do this. So I'm, I'm kind of looking into it. So I'm, I'm really building up like that base now of fitness where I'm, I'm almost trying to build a speed base first and kind of knock out some shorter distances and in pretty decent times. And then I, I want to let the speed go. Not, not as much of a focus, obviously. Start logging miles and uh, cross some stuff off. We'll see. Dad, so, dude, you're leaving, leaving the people hanging on it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know you're, you know, you've been big into ultra running. You've, you've kind of gotten into it as well. And I think what blew my mind is, you know, I, I feel like I have a, a healthy respect for what it takes. And I don't think you fully understand what it takes till you're out there. Like you can understand going in, like, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, whether that's like a 50 mile distance or a hundred or whatever. But until you actually are out there and you really realize. Uh, but one thing that you put out there that was like mind blowing to me is for your 52 miler this year, you went 100,000 steps. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> that was eye opening to where the scale of it became real, where I was like, this is insane. 100,000 steps is 52 miles. That's, that's insane. And that's on a very tough course. Like you did one of the toughest courses in ultra running. Um, I think it would easily, you know, be up there. And uh, that blew my mind. That was, your footage is crazy too. I love the footage from that race. Crazy footage. Um, that, I don't know. That was, that was wild though. 100,000 steps. I mean, how did that feel? Um, You know, I mean, it felt like I took a hundred thousand steps. I'll say that. <laughs> um, but I mean, I did that same race last year, the same 52 mile race. Uh, and, and you mentioned it's a tough race. It's actually, I think one of the few 50 mile races that'll actually qualify you for like several bigger hundred mile races, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a gnarly race, man. I mean, it's mud. It's like incline decline. You're never really running on flat ground. It's like 90% single track trail. It's so beautiful too. Like it's, uh, I'm definitely biased because I'm from Wyoming. I mean, the course is like an hour and a half, two hours from where I grew up, but like, it's gotta be one of the best ultra marathons in the country. Um, but I, I again, from last year to this year, just a totally different experience. Like last year is my first time doing that distance. Uh, 
didn't train properly, didn't have the right shoes, didn't have the right socks. And so just going through the motions and this applies to any race distance is like going out, running a half marathon, learning about it, and then going to do a full marathon, learning about it, doing that experience, seeing what it's like to run that distance. And then you come back and it, I think every single time you do it after that, it gets a little bit better, a little bit better just cause you're learning more and you're, you're figuring out the, the ins and outs of it. Um, but yeah, this year, I mean, I had like a two hour PR. I felt fine afterwards. And a lot of it too, that helped, I think was I, I mentally treated it like I was going to run a hundred miles, but I obviously only did 50. And so, you know, the ultimate goal is to do the hundred miler next summer. Um, so I think, you know, these things are so mental and just having that perspective shift probably helped a lot. What would you say were the key differences you made in training from last year to where you ran it in like, I think it was roughly 13 hours this year in 11. That's obviously a massive time improvement. So what made it so much more comfortable? What'd you do in training to, to lead up to this one? Uh, definitely more downhill running. Cause a lot of that course is downhill and anytime you're in the mountains, obviously you're gonna have to get used to, to different ups and downs on the terrain. And so, uh, there's a, this hill, of, it's called the hill of life in Austin. It's like a half mile hill that I just did over and over and over again, up and down, up and down for like three, four hours at a time. Um, and a lot of it too, I think came from, uh, switching up my strength training, just like more intentional strength training. Uh, so like a lot more single leg stuff, really focusing on like eccentric movements. So like Bulgarian split squats, reverse lunges, forward lunges, uh, like anything single leg, like single leg RDLs and just really getting used to balancing on one leg and having really good stability. Um, I think all those things combined just made a huge difference because my legs felt fantastic the whole time. I mean, they hurt like you're running, but it like they never felt weak. So I think that was all those things combined made a huge difference. I, I'm hoping, you know, do you have any, um, do you have any aspirations to ever try like hard rock or anything like that? Hard rock 100. You thought about that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Big, yeah. Bighorn is a, a hard rock qualifier. So <clears throat> it's also a Western States qualifier, which is cool. And those are definitely two races I want to do. So the idea is to do Bighorn next summer and then eventually Western States, eventually hard rock. Um, I don't know where I'd go from there, but yeah, dude, I, I, it's incredible. I think it's so cool that you knew, you know, Goggins and, and Anton and all these people, decades ago before anybody else knew who they were and you weren't even in the ultra running space that was like when ultra running was first kind of getting popular which is which is really cool yeah like carl Meltzer, all these guys i was like a big fan like i it was it was kind of when powerlifting was more underground too it wasn't as mainstream and i mean i loved it i was following all these races because the original races were like you had western states bighorn was one of the originals you had hard rock leadville um was satch bear 100 like oh i'm i know all these like um so they have a lot of prestige in my brain where i'm like these are the these are the main ones and they're all legendary in my opinion but i don't know it, it's there's something about it it's just so cool to like push your body to that limit um i wouldn't you know i don't know about you i like something like bad water doesn't interest me at all because it's just a suffer fest with no scenery i mean there's scenery you're in the desert but uh, but like the mountain races, yeah. that's where it's at. I love being in the mountains. That's so cool. And uh, like the footage you got of Bighorn was the best footage on the internet. That's so cool to see when, you know, the wall, you're going up a thousand feet in one mile, which is insane. I mean, I don't, what did that feel like? You're going up a thousand foot climb in one mile. <laughs> you know, it's actually at that point in the race, it's, it's kind of like a good reprieve because the first for the 50 mile race, the first 18 miles are all downhill. So it's like three hours straight of just downhill running. And you finally, when you get to the wall, that's your first real uphill. Okay. And so you're finally working different muscles. You give your knees a break, your quads a break. Um, so at that point in the race, it's like, it's actually not bad. You kind of look forward to it actually. Um, now I think on the other hand, like when you're doing the hundred mile distance, it's obviously going to be a little bit different. So I, I can't speak from that experience, but, um, I used to hate hiking and like going uphill cause it's slower. The miles take forever. It's like, you know, 20 minutes a mile sometimes. Uh, but I've come to love the uphill cause you can just get into a groove, like put your head down, your legs are just on fire. Like, I, I don't know. I come to love that part of it. Yeah. And I think one of the, one of the crazy things was this year for you guys. So it, Last year, I saw the forecast was like 99 degrees was the high. And then this yeah. year, it was like 50. 
it, it was was it like way more enjoyable as far as the weather this year oh definitely yeah it was uh last year was hot i got like gnarly sunburn it was <laughs> it was hot uh this year was way better it was like perfect running temperature and anything between like 40 degrees to 60 degrees i would consider ideal running temperature so what was the toughest part of the whole race if you could break it down what do you think oh man mud? i think it's the the mud sucks at first uh but you kind of just get used to it like at first like your shoes are clean your legs are clean you know it's early in the morning you're like i don't want to step in this mud right now like my feet my feet are gonna be wet my socks are gonna be wet but it's inevitable. Like at some point, like there's points on the course where you have no other choice other than to go through the mud. And so once you finally go through it, you're like, fuck it, we're doing it. We're in the mud. And so you just, then it's like mud comes up at some points. Like you could go around, but you're like, whatever, I'm just going to go through it. So the mud's not bad. Um, I think it's kind of fun at some points. It's like makes this real nice squishy sound when you're walking through it. <laughs> but uh, the hardest part of the course, I think, is uh, the last... Uh, it's from like mile 35 to like 45 because you're again like 10 miles straight of downhill and at that point you've already done a lot of downhill your legs are pretty gassed and you gotta just run another 10 miles like down some really steep mountain trails and uh if you a lot of it depends on how you paced the beginning of the race like if you didn't pace properly your quads are probably gonna be shot your knees are shot front of your toes are probably sore from hitting the front of your shoes so that's probably the hardest part but you know it's just like it's like the last six miles of a marathon. It's like, oh. that's what you signed up for. You oh. signed up to get to that point where it's like, why am I out here? What am I doing? And I think that's the best part about all of it is, is when you start asking yourself those questions. And, uh, I don't know. That's why I do it. That's, that's why I think a lot of people do it too. That's awesome. Yeah. I know. I remember that even when I was 15 years old, hitting the, the 20 mile mark and I hadn't had anywhere near enough calories. I had like maybe one gel. And I just crashed hard. I was on pace for four hours up till 20. And then I just blew up because I didn't fuel at all. So I, I totally get that. Fueling is such a, a part of the game to an ultra running where you have to be taking in a lot of calories and a lot of, I saw you like were hammering the, the salt pills because you have to, you're just going to burn through it so quick. So much sweating, even if it's cool. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. The salt is huge. I, I, cramped hard last year because i thought i was taking enough but it's hard in the mountains too because it's not usually that warm typically uh and it's like dry up in the mountains so you don't feel like you're sweating a lot and so it's easy to not get enough salt and electrolytes in so i i was doing like a i think over a thousand milligrams of salt per hour this last time and i felt great the whole time no cramping or anything um there's also an interesting study that i found the other day that said uh one lower body strength training session a week actually has a greater effect on preventing cramping than sodium and so obviously you need sodium too but like if you strength train that's going to have more of an effect on preventing cramping than than even focusing on electrolytes i could see that because cramps are really something i don't deal with um and haven't dealt with before like even on these hot runs where the dew point is like 75 and you're just sweating like crazy uh, cramping has not been an issue for me you know, one thing I, that's actually kind of interesting. So you are at sea level basically. And so am I, what, what was it yeah. like? How did altitude affect you? Was it there any effect? Did you do anything to train for that? Um, there's really not much you can do other than to be at elevation. Uh, I mean, I think they make those like chambers you can sleep in or something, but I really didn't feel it a whole lot. Maybe, maybe like, I don't know, like 5% if that's a good way to quantify it, I guess, like I might've felt it a little bit. Um, and I, I don't know the science behind it, but like I grew up in Wyoming at over a mile high. I was there for 20 years, the first 20 years of my life. So I don't know if like I had, I kept some of that acclimation. Uh, and like, you know, when I go back, my body's already kind of used to that. I don't know if that's true. That's just my hunch. Cause I know some people like they'll go to Wyoming, like, Oh my God, we're like six, 7,000 feet. And they're like, I can't breathe. And I'm like, I feel fine, even though like I haven't been here for a couple of years. So I don't know if I kept any of that or what, but I I think it has minimal effect, at least in my experience. Yeah, we were in Laramie last year and Laramie's at 7,200 feet and I felt fine. Like yeah. I didn't notice anything, but I'll know people who will feel like even just walking around in it, they'll be like, man, the altitude, I don't feel any difference. So 
That's uh, that's interesting, but okay. What were you doing in Laramie? Powerlifting me. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy because <laughs> this is how that worked out. My sister's in Fort Collins, and so I was like, all right, I'll uh, I'll find a meet kind of close to her, powerlifting meet. So we drove up. We flew into Denver, drove up from Fort Collins to Laramie. First time in Laramie, I was like, I fell in love with it. Loved it. I loved the food. I loved Medicine Bow National Forest. I loved Medicine Bow Peak. Mm -hmm. um, all that. Just absolutely loved it. There was hardly anybody up there. There was tons of snow. Um, it was June. So it was like June 10th, and there was still a ton of snow up there. Uh, Mere Lake, right in front of Medicine Bow Peak. Yeah. We drove through this little town, Centennial. Like, um mm -hmm. Oh, it was gorgeous. And ate at uh, Jay's Prairie Rose Cafe. That place was awesome. <laughs> Best freaking breakfast food ever. It's this diner where it's jam-packed. You know all about it. Uh, we stayed We stayed right across from the stadium. Like, oh, man, I, I love Laramie. It's like my favorite city. That's so funny. <laughs> Dude, I think the population is like, I think when school is not in session, it's like ten or 12,000. It's such a tiny little town, middle of nowhere, Wyoming uh that's so funny <laughs> that you guys went through there it's a it's a cool little town though i mean you know you get the elevation you get the mountains right there did you guys go to uh to vitavu while you were there no i don't know what is that oh dude it's like it's as crazy it's on the other side of laramie versus where medicine bow is at but it's it looks like this alien formation it reminds me of like easter island or some crazy kind of thing like it's obviously a natural uh monument kind of thing um but it's like these big i think it's like limestone rocks or something and they it's like it's one of the wildest places i've ever been um if you ever go back you definitely gotta stop by there it's a, it's called vita vu oh i i fell in love with that area i want to go back so bad like that was probably one of the most memorable trips i've ever been on so it was it was awesome we we drove up through cheyenne headed over to laramie hung out there for a while back to fort collins Denver. It was, it was great, great trip. So, um, I definitely love the West and the cool thing about Wyoming, you'll be on the interstate driving and you could be driving on the interstate for an hour and you'll pass two cars. It's crazy. I'm just, yep. it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a crazy place. I, I miss it a lot. Um, I miss parts of it a lot. I mean, there, it's hard, like for what I'm trying to do, you know, within online health and fitness and, and content it's like not a great place um just because there's not a lot of other people doing that but dude the scenery there is amazing the weather during the summer has got to be some of the best in the world um i almost hate like talking it up too much because it's i don't want people to go there <laughs> because it's like it's the least populated state in the country and i think that's part of what makes it so great is there's so much space and there's just so much beauty there and it's so much of it's just untouched very windy too the wind is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy everywhere yeah. you go. I, um, I think that's what keeps a lot of people out too. No, I got have, I got one last question for you. Like, have you gotten your blood work checked? I'm just really curious, like, what, what your stuff would look like. Dude, I actually haven't. And while you were talking about all that earlier, I was like, dude, I need to get my blood work checked. Um, I don't know why I haven't. I never felt like I needed to because I've always felt good. I've never needed, like, you know, had, like, an excuse of... Uh, something feels off i should probably go get checked and so that's a you know a good problem to have i guess but um i i definitely want to especially uh i've thought about doing it um like before and after a race oh so God. like you know i've got chicago this october so like maybe you know i think it'd be probably ideal to do it like now like before i really get into the, the depths of training and then do it maybe like the week before the race and then like a day or two after the race i think that'd be really interesting to do um that's a good content. Idea. No, it's like for the that. sake of science, I'd want to see what an elite runner's blood work looks like. Like, I'd be so curious to see your hematocrit, your red blood cells, as far as like oxygen production, stuff like that. Um, just all the health based biomarkers, how good they are. Like this stuff would be fascinating to see because, you know, you're very fast runner. So it's just, it's kind of cool. And, and we, no one's touching on it. So it'd be like, Re, you know, introducing that to the running community would be kind of cool where it's like, this is cool. See your testosterone levels, all that. It'd be amazing. I think you should totally do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's a good idea. I'm, I think later this week I'm going to do a video on like how running affects your hormones. But I think, you know, doing an actual like hands-on test would be so much more valuable for people. Um, 
What, where do you typically go to do your blood testing? Okay, so I use the website Merrick Health um, because, I mean, I'm kind of, I have like an affiliate code with them, uh, but they're the best because you can custom pick exactly what you want to get checked. So I can give you like a list. Here's what you should look at. I should, I'll give you a list and it'll be like, here's the 12 things you should look into. And you can literally pick all of those and you can customize the panel. So I'll do like one more extensive panel a year where I check everything. And then every couple of months I'll, I'll check a couple things to kind of see how they're improving. But it's, it's so much better. So what I do is I order it off there. It's not even that expensive, like truthfully. Order it off there. They email you a form. You take the form into like a lab core. So the lab core I go to is in Knoxville. It's in a Walgreens. I go into the back of Walgreens, go to the lab core, sign in, hand them the sheet. They draw my blood. I get the email results back in like a week. It's simple as that. Oh, damn. That's so easy. What, is, what does something like that cost? Okay, so the, the panel I'm getting done, I think it'll, maybe tomorrow, hopefully. That one's like 120 usually. Um, if I'm doing a really extensive panel, like the one I'll do once a year, it could be like 250 But even like you can pick individually, it shows you the price of each thing. So like to check your insulin, $11. To check your apolipoprotein B, $15. So you can like piece together this panel and see exactly how much it's going to cost. And uh, I don't know, it's great. Like I love seeing all that stuff. Cause then I can know exactly what's going on. Yeah. That's super. It's like biohacking. You can be like, okay, here's what I need to work on. This is, this is a little off and you can figure out like, okay, maybe you need to take this vitamin to help with that. So it's like, you can almost biohack your performance to be even more efficient. You can find any problem and be like, I'm going to, here's what I can do to try to fix that. So it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a super reasonable price too. Um, yeah. Again, I don't know why I haven't gone in and done that. I really need to, um, You've inspired me. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm looking to do it right after this podcast. Uh, you said it was called Merrick. Yeah, Merrick Health. Um, I can like send you a list of the things I check, and you can be like, dude, it, it's I'm I'm almost more curious to see yours because I've seen mine a million times. But I'd be like, you're an elite runner, so I want to see. I no one like there's no there's no information out here on elite runners as far as what they're. Um, blood work looks like like i'd be so curious i'm like what, what 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 are you at for all this stuff like what would it look like on someone who's a 245 marathon runner like no there's nothing out there nothing so i think that'd be really cool i'm like okay that's that's pretty cool i don't know yeah well, well first off i'm definitely not elite to me maybe you are. i'm an elite content <laughs> I'm an elite content runner. I'll, I'll say okay. that. <laughs> to me, I mean, 245, I'm like, I know you haven't done it quite yet, but 250, same okay. thing. Like, to me, I'm like, that's freaking okay. elite. I don't even care. Um, like, to me, you're like, well, like what, what you think of, you think of somebody like 215 marathon. I'm like, to me, that's you at two, 250. Okay, well, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, so now that you've uh, transitioned more into running, uh, I know you're still lifting. What does like a typical training day or training week look like? Maybe let's start with uh, a typical week and we'll break it down into training day. Yeah, so it'd be Sunday is the off day. Sunday is the one day off. I've got the most work as far as my clients and all that. So that, that one is off. Monday, lactate threshold type run. Um, you know, basically a couple rounds of speed that sort of thing at a certain pace where I'm trying to maintain it for a progressively longer time. I'll do i I'll bench that day as well. Maybe some overhead press. So the, I'll do the, the strength training first and then I'll run after I'm always running like midday heat. It's like the worst time possible. It's always like 1 PM because that's just what works with the schedule. It sucks. I hate it. I'd like to run in the morning or evening, but it's what works. So I'll do that Monday, Tuesday, deadlifts, lower body, um, easy run which will be like five, six miles. Wednesday will be a speed workout, typically on the track, repeats, 400s, 800s, that sort of thing. And I'll do bench again. Thursday, easy run, five, six miles. Friday, last bench day, bench three times a week, one assistance movement. And then Friday is also, that's the long run. So that's right now, it's like 10, 11 miles. Um, and then Saturday, one more easy run, five, six. 
And that's pretty much what the week looks like. So mileage wise, it's like 40, 45, three bench days, one lower body. Um, strength training, keep it pretty short. It'll be like two exercises, throw some core in on the side. That's about it. That's what that looks like. So do you, uh, do you typically lift and then run or run and then lift? I'll lift first, but it's, uh, like I said, it's only one lower body because that's much more taxing on your running. Like if I bench, it doesn't seem to affect my running, but like a lower body session will definitely blow your legs up. So, uh, I, I do the lifting first. Typically it's just what works with the schedule. Um, but I get that like full week break before the next lower body day. Cause if you do too much of that, like it kills your legs, they're blown up. Yeah. What's up? What's, what's your lower body session typically look like <laughs> right now, right now it's deadlifts and back extensions. So deadlifts and 45 degree back extensions. And that's pretty much it. Like I just, I've been doing, I've done split squats a lot in the past, but I just, I, I'm so like mentally over squatting right now that I'm just like, screw this. I'm not going to do it for a while. <laughs> Um, I'll get back to split squats, but I don't even know if I'll back squat. I just, it doesn't feel good for me. I hate back squats. So, and then you, you know how hard it is to run after squatting. Oh my God. So like, oh, yeah. you know, there, there'll come a time where I'll, I'll place more of an emphasis on that again. But right now it's just been like deadlifts and then back extensions. Cause I'm trying to get a big deadlift. I just don't care about squats right now. Uh, I've been doing it my whole life. I'm like over it, but. Like bench and deadlift, that's good. <laughs> so do you, is that, uh, when you were like peak powerlifting, is that kind of how you'd set up your, your strength sessions as well as like just focus on like that core compound movement and then like one accessory? No, no, it was like four hour sessions of, Oh shit. yeah, there was, I mean, when my squat was the best, I was squatting three days a week, high volume. Um, and then there was times where I would deadlift once a week, squat once a week, heavy, really heavy. And then a bunch of accessories after that. Bench three days a week, a bunch of accessories after that. Spend four or five hours in the gym just lifting. Um, and that was what I was doing at my peak. But right now there's no time for that. With running, um, lifting, having a daughter, a 15-month-old, having a gym to kind of help manage with my wife. Like yesterday, I had to train four clients in person, four personal training sessions, which you end up going over an hour. So it's like five hours of that. Then I still have my online clients for, for strength training because I basically make a living by um, online programming people how to get stronger. Like that's that's what I do. If you want if people want to get stronger that they come to me, that's that's what that's what I do. But I also still have in person training and I get up at 430 every weekday to open the gym. So it's like. I, and then I have to run classes here. So it's like I've got all this stuff on my plate where it's like I can't I can't spend too much time on one thing. So I try to balance it the best I can. It sucks, but I make it work. That's a lot, man. I think that's uh that's one of the things I get questioned on the most is like this whole hybrid thing of like how do you have time for that? Like like nobody has time to run and lift every single day. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have kids. And that, that's a, always the comment. It's like, wow, it must be nice to not have kids. But like, there's so many people that do it with kids. I'm like, even if I had a kid, like I'd still figure out a way to make it work. And like, I mean, I, I want to ask somebody like you who does it and has a kid. Like, is it possible? You know what you do? This is the, this is the secret. Like, the secret formula is when you put <laughs> your kid down for the nap, because there's always a midday nap, that's when you run. So that's why I have to run at 1 p.m. when it's blazing hot out. But it's like, that's what works with the schedule. So my daughter will go down for a nap and she'll be down maybe four upwards of five hours at times. She'll go down like 1030, wake up at 330. So it's like within that window is when I have to get this run done. And it, you just make it work. Like it's it sucks. The heat is a killer. I cannot wait for fall. I am over this Tennessee summer heat. It, it <laughs> kills my, it makes it so much harder. It's terrible. But I'm like, you know what? It's going to help when it gets cooler. I'm going to be faster. It's whatever. I make it work. Um, so I can't run in the early hours. Like I get up at 430, but I have responsibilities. So I can't do it then. And then in the evening, I need to be with my family and get ready for the next day. So I can't do it then. So it's like you can carve out that time, but it might not be when you want to do it, but you can get it done. And like the key is when they when they go down for a nap, that's when you do it. 
dude, that's, that's a perfect answer is if you have something you want to do, you make the time, you figure out a way to, to get it done. I think, uh, I think a lot of people, they just justify why they shouldn't do something like it's, it's so it's like a cop out of like, Oh, I don't have time. I think that's one of the worst excuses in the world. Um, and I think that's one of the cool things with like this hybrid style of like, you have to do multiple workouts a day, a lot of days of the week, and it forces you to manage your time better and prioritize things better. Um, so that's, that's a cool element of it. Uh, what does a, uh, a typical day of eating look like for you? Oh my it's a uh, diet has never been something I've leaned into very hard. So I'll start the day out and I'll have like, I don't even measure it. Honestly, I don't measure the amount. There's no macros tracking. I'll have ground turkey, the 90-10 ground turkey, and then jasmine rice. And I mix them together. I put sugar-free sweet chili sauce on, douse it in salt, just absolutely douse it in a ridiculous amount of salt because it helps my, like I, I, if I don't do that and I try to run, I just bonk. There's no, there's no energy. So I'll take a, I'll take a one gram salt tab too, before I run in the summer and just douse my food in salt and all of that. And then I'll have like a, usually like a rain, like I got one here, 300 milligrams of caffeine. Oh, nice. And that'll be pretty much it for the first, I mean, from like waking up at four 30 until I get home at like six or seven, that's it. It's not much, not many calories, but I'm also trying to stay lean. And then I'll get home and it's like a free for all. So the evening, I just do all the damage. I'll have like 2,000, 2,500 calories. Just, it's like pizza one night. I'll have a whole pizza. I'll have ice cream. I'll have Texas <laughs> toast, chips and queso, candy, whatever I feel like. Like, I just, I'll go to the grocery store and just start getting donut. It could be anything. So, my actual protein intake is extremely low, which, <laughs> like, my macros are not to be replicated, but this is what's worked. This is how I've leaned out. I've gotten crazy lean, um, gotten to 205. I'll probably stabilize eventually at, like, 195, 190. But uh, not, a, not a great diet, but it's it works for me, and it allows me to still eat some fun things. Last, like, last night, I had... <laughs> I had two glazed donuts, and then I had <laughs> two hot dogs with ketchup, and then I had some ice cream, and then I had some chips and queso, <laughs> and that was that was like <laughs> dinner. So it just it's not it's not great, but I enjoy my food. That's my one thing. Oh like that's the God. one thing where I I need to have my food and enjoy it. That's so funny, dude. That's like a that's like what I would eat when I was 12 it's years great. old. It's awesome. That's so, that's so, I mean, that's one of the cool things about running is um, you can get away with doing shit like that and you'll be just fine. I mean, do you feel a fine? Like, do you, do you feel like you've got plenty oh, of energy? Yeah. Like it doesn't make you feel like I shit. was, I was like trying gels out for a while. And then I was like, I'm not, I'm, it's not enough. It's not enough carbs. I'm not having enough energy. So I tried out these uh, Jolly Rancher gummies and it was like 130 carbs, and I, I downed a pack of those, and I had like the best run of my life. I was like, why am I having gels when I could just eat candy? <laughs> so I, I had more energy from the candy just because it was way more carbs. And I feel great. Like it, if as long as I have enough fuel in me, enough glycogen, enough carbs, it yeah. doesn't seem to matter um, as far as it goes for me. Like I feel perfect. That's so funny. Yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh... I, I used to be so, I still kind of am so afraid of like added sugars and stuff, but I just had this dietitian on the podcast a couple of days ago. And she said like, from an athlete perspective, like added sugar shouldn't be scary because like for how much you're exercising and running, like you need the carbs and your, your body, from my understanding, it doesn't really know the difference between like, uh, a sugar from like a candy versus like a sugar from a gel or a fruit or something. It might, I know there's like, there's fructose and then another form of sugar, but I, like it still just breaks down into, into glycogen either way. And so I don't know if that really makes a difference, but, um, do you, uh, <laughs> do you know Courtney DeWalter, oh, yeah. the, the ultra runner? Dude, that the diet you just described sounds exactly like her diet. Yeah. <laughs> like she's eating candy and soda and pizza and hot dogs. And it's like, she's literally the most elite 
female ultra runner to ever exist and it's like maybe there's something to I it i don't know <laughs> i the only thing i really drink outside of like rain i'll have a rain energy drink but outside of that it's all water i drink you know i've got a reverse osmosis water filter or whatever and i just drink water but i love to eat some food I, I i love food i'm not gonna give it up i can't that's that's like if you're gonna have an addiction in life you, you gotta pick one that's not very destructive so like my blood work, even with eating some bad things is impeccable because I think of all the cardiovascular exercise and I, I try to keep the calories low all day. And then the evening I pig out. So like that mitigates the damage. It's not like an all day thing. Um, but like, I don't not, I don't have a lot of, I don't have any vices. It's just like food. I like to, I like to eat things. Um, so it could be, there could be worse things. There could be things that could anabolic steroids, you know, it's like, there could be much worse things than me being like, I want to have a pizza tonight, you know? So I, I don't know. I, I so much that that's another thing I love about running. I'm like, I can do this and it's not affecting me that bad. Um, and truthfully, I mean, I felt like anabolic steroids affected my blood work way worse than, than junk food, like way worse. Mm -hmm. So this, this is like the healthiest I've ever been in my life by far. And I, I love that stuff. I love eating good food. Have you ever, uh, like, since you've gotten really obsessed with blood work and, and the metabolic stuff, have you tested it all? Like, okay, what if we eat like super clean for like a month and then, you know, go back to like the hot, <laughs> the hot dogs and pizza and stuff. Like, have you tested yes, that? And all? you know, what's crazy about it. So much of it is genetic that like people are predisposed to higher cholesterol levels or whatever, or, or that sort of thing diet doesn't budget that much it really doesn't diet has more of a role really? in blood pressure um so if you eat cleaner your blood pressure tends to be lower but you know what's crazy the cardiovascular exercise has way more effect on blood work and blood pressure than diet like it's it's absurd like me just doing intense running sessions where my heart rate gets up logging a lot of miles staying super lean i think one of the reasons as well that my blood work is so good is i'm like really low body fat and I think that plays a role. Um, but from what I've seen, the cardiovascular exercise moves the needle on the blood work way more than diet. Like you're going to have way better blood work simply by logging a lot of miles, doing intense sessions, than by cleaning up your diet and not doing that stuff. You know, maybe it would be slightly better if you ate impeccably as well. But like just simply getting the miles in, getting in shape, your blood work's going to be incredibly top tier even if you want to eat some things that aren't so good for you and i've seen it firsthand i've done it it's like nothing affects your your biochemistry and your biomarkers and your overall health more than cardio nothing it's it's 100 percent does way more for blood pressure way more for lipids all that sort of stuff than just cleaning up diet alone that's crazy i, I totally believe that though like I, I think i've heard atia talk about that maybe like huberman um some of these other doctors that that like if they're gonna recommend somebody make a lifestyle change it's just to exercise more like yeah clean up your diet sleep better cut out alcohol whatever but like i think strength training cardio any form of exercise trumps all of those things and it if, it sounds like you're saying that the cardio specifically is going to make the biggest difference. That's what I've seen. My anecdotal evidence from my own panels and my own markers, resting heart rate, that sort of thing. It, the, the game changer is cardio. That is the ultimate game changer. Like doing intense cardio sessions, whether it's running or anything, that's what keeps you at an optimal health. So I don't, I don't see myself ever getting away from it again, even though it's something I'm new to. How could I go away from it when I've, it's literally made my health way better than at any other point in my life. And it, it, it does way more than diet. So it's like, I could never not do it. At least something, even if it wasn't running, I'd have to do something, but running to me is like the ultimate stimulus for that. So the changes are insane. I've seen so many crazy changes. I feel so much better. Um, skin looks so much better, gotten so much leaner. It's just, everything is I can't overstate just from my experience how how much it helps. It's it's the ultimate game changer. Have you have you uh, read or heard of David Sinclair? He wrote Lifespan. Yes, I followed some of his work for sure. 
yeah, he talks about uh, in, in that book of like your telomeres. It's like I think that, that portion of your DNA that is essentially a predictor for your lifespan and how long you're going to live. And, and like I think it's more specifically like your biological age. Um, and the number one way to positively affect those telomeres, uh, aka like extending your lifespan, is exercise. And it's again, it's not diet, it's not sleep. All those other things are important too, but it's the exercise. And I think the uh, there's another study I saw a couple of weeks ago. I, I kind of talked about it on another podcast, but uh, uh, any form of physical exercise is 1.5 times more effective at. Uh, oh, I'm trying to figure out the way to word it right. 1.5 times more effective at lessening the symptoms of anxiety and depression versus pills. So like SSRI, antidepressant pills, and therapy. So like, again, to say it more concisely, exercise is more effective than pills and therapy when it comes to mental health too. It's just like exercise is should be a staple of every single person's lifestyle. Yeah, I 100% believe it. I mean, I'm not taking any medication. I'm not on TRT. I'm on nothing but vitamins. And I've seen it like firsthand, all these blood panels, I've seen it. All my blood pressure, my resting heart rate, all that sort of stuff. Um, complete game changer and like the runner side thing is real like i feel amazing afterward um but yeah my computer is getting real down close to dying <laughs> i don't want to just cut out on you okay <laughs> no it's gonna go and no that's okay We're... that's okay we've been ripping pretty good for for almost two hours now um I feel like we could chat for a while but um dude this is a really really fun podcast man this is honestly i don't want to you know play favorites but this might be one of my favorite podcasts i've done so far i feel like it we just flowed well you got a really really cool story um you provided a ton of knowledge and, and valuable information for people and a lot of inspiration and i just appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story yeah we'll do it again for sure I, I gotta get back with brock too and and i love talking to you guys because it's a it's a new community and this is kind of what i want to segue into so i really appreciate you having me on and uh, i'm looking up to you your times and all that it's crazy going to be curious to see what your blood work looks like. So I really appreciate it. Oh yeah. Dude, well, I'm going to, I've learned a lot from you already and I know I'm going to keep looking to you for, for inspiration and, and knowledge in other areas too. Um, where is the best place for people to find you at and connect with just you? Just on my uh, YouTube. So just Pete period Rubish, you'll find me on there. Um, I also have an Instagram. I'm, I'm active on there as well. So those are the main two places. YouTube is, is really the spot though. Beautiful, man. Well, if you're ever down here in uh, Austin, Texas, we got to get together, get in a run, a lift, and uh, do an in-person podcast. Yeah, too. for sure. That'd be so much better just having like the in-person effect. So I'm down. Let's do it, man. All right, dude. Well, thanks again for coming on. We'll, yes, uh, we'll sir. Appreciate you, you, buddy. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you in the next one.